One, two, three, four. Fire! Good afternoon. I'm Alan Mordecai. I'm president of the Tidewater Maritime Living History Association. And what I'm bringing to, for you to consider is the family of Dahlgren-designed boat howitzers. Now, the first question that most people say is, well, what's a, what makes a boat howitzer different from any other kind of cannon from the Civil War era? Well, the boat howitzer is designed for a specific purpose and for a specific role, and it's em employed on certain specific platforms. When one thinks of field artillery in the Civil War era, one thinks of a team of six horses pulling a two-wheeled cart with men riding on them in an ammunition chest and a cannon attached to the rear. And as the army song goes, over hill and dale and dusty trail, the caissons go rolling along. This is true, and this works very well on field artillery on land. Uh, the Army is well known by the Civil War. There were numbers on, on both sides of artillery batteries that moved in this way. This works good on land, but however, before the advent of railroads and steamships, when uh, artillery needed to be moved from place to place over long distances, especially in different areas, geographic areas, say for example during the Mexican-American War, when artillery had to be moved from the continental United States down to the coast of Mexico. You had to, there, it required a much more complex and much more involved set of procedures and had much more uh, limitations on how the guns could be employed while on the move. For example, if guns needed to be taken, say, to Monterey uh, or other places where there were no dock facilities to offload the, the guns and horses onto the pier, one would have to bring the ships in, anchor them offshore, construct rafts, place the guns and limbers on the raft, put the horses into the ocean and have the horses swim ashore, and have long rowboats row the guns ashore on rafts. There are three main limitations to doing this. One, the water had to be flat calm. If there was any sort of surf running whatsoever, the rafts would be very easy to, to capsize and you would lose the guns and potentially men as well, and horses in the surf. Two, if the place you were intending to land was occupied by any tr enemy troops, they weren't going to sit by and allow you to land unimpeded. So you would have to fight your way ashore through a storm of musket and cannon fire. This would make the guns, the cannons on their rafts, sitting targets. So this was not a way to do it. And uh, third, with the guns mounted on rafts like this, if they were going onto an opposing beach, the guns could not be made to fire on the raft. This would cause them to capsize, flip over, guns would be lost in, in the sea. During the Mexican War, then Lieutenant John Dahlgren observed these kind of landing procedures. And being a sailor as he was, he tried to come up with a more suitable way to transport artillery from a ship at anchor to a beach. After the Mexican War, he was promoted and then made in, uh, put in charge of the Ordnance Department at the Washington Navy Yard. While there, he sat down to the drawing board and he designed his own specifically purpose-built amphibious landing gun. That's what you see here. This is one of the family of Dahlgren boat howitzers. So this gun is what we call a 12 pound light. There were several different models and variations made. There was the 12 pound small, which the entire gun, barrel, carriage and all weighed about 450 pounds. These were determined to be too small and too fragile for use in combat. And they were very, very quickly discontinued, except for ceremonial use. This is considered the 12 pound light. This was the smallest size gun that was used in a regular naval service. Uh, there were several variations of this. There were the 12 pound, uh, 12 pound smooth bores, and there were three and a half inch rifled versions. In either case, these guns were designed very different from a field gun that you see on land. And if the, some of the features you can see right here are apparent just to look at them. One, the carriage, the carriage itself is made out of uh, iron, in this case, because it's a modern replica, is made of steel. Pound per pound, iron or steel is much stronger than wood. So the, the carriages could be made physically smaller and smaller in dimensions and still be as strong as a, a much, much heavier field gun. Uh, the design of this also allowed for a, a, a shiftable trail wheel. As you see here, the trail, trail wheel is in the up position. Now this, can, this is in the firing position, so the gun, when it recoils, would only slide on a small square patch of steel. Now, if you would, to 
prepare the gun for travel, the trail would be lifted, the wheel moved back into position, and a pin inserted in to the axle. That's good enough. Let's go. Okay. So now with the gun, with the wheel in the down position and a hand spike inserted, the gun can be easily maneuvered around. To steer the gun, you would lift a trail, shift the gun from left to right, and then put it back down, and then to move it forward is a relatively easy task. The normal crew of a gun for this size is 16 men and an officer. And with 16 men, six were needed to fire the gun proper. The other 10 men were used to help to prolong or pull the gun. There is a tow line that hooks onto the trail of the gun, and the rest of the gun crew would travel the gun inland, needing no horses. Also, if you'll get the equipment box. The ammunition boxes carried eight rounds apiece with a round, a, an actual projectile, a wooden sabo, and a one pound powder charge. This would be the representative side. Now the gun is provided here, as you can see, with a bronze or brass framework, which has two to, uh, some studs that, or pins sitting upright in the, in the frame. The box, the ammunition box, could be placed on here. This is a picture of the, the ammunition chest mounted onto the frame. And in this, in this situation, the gun carriage itself becomes the de facto limber. So eight rounds could be carried on one side, eight on another. Each member of the gun crew would carry one individual round in a haversack. So, so 16 rounds mounted to the gun, and for the 16 sailors in the gun crew, an additional 16 rounds could be carried inland for a total of 32 rounds. If resupply was required, if the guns were ashore for any extended period of time, more ammunition would be brought up from the beach. To give a comparison between this gun and an ordinary, typical three-inch ordnance rifle, which is a standard artillery piece, a, a three-inch rifle weighs somewhere in the, op, op, in the vicinity of around 2,000 pounds. This gun, as it sits right now, weighs about 750 pounds. So that the portability of this gun is much improved. Its, uh, its compact size makes it easy to transport by boat. Uh, and as we'll see in a moment, the gun can actually operate and fire from a boat. Another feature that makes the gun unique is something that is not found on most Civil War artillery pieces. This gun, this gun has, and all Dahlgren boat howitzers have what are called a hammer lock. Uh, field guns in the field today and the most reenactment guns use a, 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 a primer that's called a friction primer, a brass tube with a rod of uh, a wire scored, pushed into it, and drawn out with a lanyard to ignite a spark. John Dahlgren's idea was to use a goose quill, split at the very top end, reamed out inside, filled with finely milled powder, and two paper discs, one on top of the other, glued on top of the, the, uh, on top of the quill, with sandwiched between them one dot of mercury fulminate, very much like a percussion cap on a musket. The whole assembly looked like nothing more than a very large nail, and it would be placed into the touch hole with the dot of mercury fulminate at the center of the top. The lanyard would be taken up, and when the gun was loaded and ready to fire, rather than pulling the lanyard to pull the wire out of the friction primer, the hammer would rotate over and strike the impact primer, thusly, and this would cause the gun to fire. Uh, because these primers were made and dipped in lacquer, they were sealed tight, and in the, for the maritime environment, they were more, much more reliable than friction primers. What you're seeing here is the slide carriage or boat carriage. This is the alternate mounting, uh, mounting position for the barrel of the boat howitzer. When on land, as we saw earlier, that the gun was mounted on a field carriage and could be rolled across open territory. For use on board deck of a ship or in the bow of a rowing vessel or the bow of a steam launch, this would be the preferred carriage to be used. This uh, had a, uh, a lightning pin, very much like the, the land carriage. The under loop of the barrel would fit right in, onto this cradle, into this cradle. The lightning pin would be inserted, and that gave the, the gun the ability to elevate. The nave enclosure in the back allowed for the elevation screw to be, be, be connected in here and to, keep the, uh, to elevate the gun up and down. These two nuts on top, these wing nuts, are called compressor nuts or compressors. The, this collide carriage is made up of three basic parts. The sled proper that the gun mounts to, the base unit that sits on the deck, and a, a keel or block underneath through which protrude 
two threaded rods upwards from underneath. With the compressors installed and tightened down, this would clamp the sled and squeeze the sled and the compressor against the base to absorb some of the recoil. The, this had to be done with a very fine sense of adjustment. If the, if the compressors were left loose, the gun would recoil all the way to the rear and shear off the back of the carriage. If they were left too tight, the entire front end of the carriage would lift off the deck. So these had to be adjusted to just the right tension to absorb the recoil as the sled slid to the rear and stopped. With the howitzer barrel mounted to the boat carriage, the procedure for loading is identical to that of on the field carriage with the exception that all positions have to be manned while the gun crew members are kneeling. The versatility of the boat howitzer is best displayed and best demonstrated during the assault phase of an amphibious landing. One in every three or four boats would be equipped with a boat howitzer mounted in the bow. From that position, the gun can be loaded and fired to support the approach of boats to the beach. One in every three or four boats would be so equipped and the boat howitzers would stand off the beach and provide Ready? overhead fire support while the assaulting boats approach the beach. Once the assaulting force reaches the beach and disembarks from their boats, they then form up and move forward to clear away any enemy presence on the beachfront. With the beachfront established, then and only then would the howitzer boat be brought forward and landed at the beach. The procedure to shift the barrel from boat carriage to field carriage would begin. In the bow of the boat, the boat howitzer barrel would be detached at the elevation screw and at the lightning bolt. A wooden spar, known as the shifting spar, would be attached to the barrel and lashed to it. At the muzzle of the gun, a wooden block called the shifting block would be placed below where the muzzle of the barrel would come in contact with the deck. With the barrel detached completely from the boat carriage, the barrel utilizing the shifting spar, the barrel would be lifted into a vertical position resting on the shifting block at the muzzle. At this point, the sled portion of the boat carriage would be removed and set aside. This would allow the clearance for the field carriage to roll forward astride of the boat carriage base. The field carriage would be moved forward from the stern of the boat to the bow of the boat, traveling on two wooden planks laid lengthwise on the boat to allow this. Once the field carriage was in position and well astride the boat carriage base, the barrel would be lowered down using the shifting spar into the cradle of the field carriage. The lightning bolt and elevation screw would be reinstalled and the gun would be then configured to travel inland as a field carriage light field gun. The two wooden tracks would be lifted up, moved forward and attached at the bow of the boat this would allow the field carriage to be lowered safely to the beach ahead of the boat. Once the boat carriage was ashore, the ammunition chests 
and all, uh, all equipment and accoutrements and implements would be brought forth to the beach. The gun would be then moved inland, being prolonged or towed by the rope by Marines and sailors, and from that point used as an ordinary lightweight field gun. Load, shot, 900 yards. On the command to load, and get range is given. The four people at the gun move to their various positions. Real. Number one and two arrange themselves at the, bow, at the muzzle of the gun. Number three clears the vent, places the thumb stall, the wetted leather pad, and turns the hammer onto it. He then presses down on it to keep it airtight. Number three goes in with the worm, clears any debris from the previously fired charge. He repeats this a second time or until the worm comes out clean. He then grounds his worm, turns his back to the gun. Number one goes in with the wetted sponge, extinguishes any burning embers that might be present, removes the sponge, inverts the tool, places the rammer on the muzzle of the gun and taps Advance the gun the muzzle three times. This is a signal to the gun captain. Number five then moves forward deposits the charge into number two's hand. Number two places the charge in the muzzle of the gun. He takes up his implement and moves to the left hand side of the gun. Number one puts the rammer into the muzzle, pushes the round to the rear, and with a smooth motion slides it to the rear, pushing his hand beneath the barrel to prevent possibly being injured if the gun goes off. At this point, Ready. the gun is to be trained and elevated. Number three moves to the rear of the gun, takes up the hand spike, inserts it into the trail. Number four, the gun captain sets the sights and elevates the gun and signals number three to shift the gun left and right until he's satisfied. Once done, the hand spike's removed. Number four guards the hammer. Number three goes forward, punches down the charge to provide an open path to the flame from the primer. Once he's complete, he takes control of the hammer. Number four then removes one primer from the pouch, places it in the vent. He then takes up the lanyard, moves away from the gun until all the slack is taken out. He then nods to number three. Number three acknowledges. Number three and four move away from the gun. Fire! And number four, the gun captain, gives the command to fire and fires the piece. Fire. Fire! <laughs> Everybody side out of the way. And fire! Fire. Fire.